Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, please, my fellow speakers, if you can just request the mic, inshallah, so I can hand it over to you. I hope you have seen the latest video by Brother Shahid, uh, the last two videos to be specific, because uh, they are closely related, inshallah, to today's today's uh, topic. So it's going to be nice, inshallah. Okay, so uh, since Brother Shahid is here, I'll just uh, start, inshallah, playing the video. Uh, it's uh, I shared it in the... Uh, group and I shared it uh, under this post so hopefully you have seen it if you didn't uh, I'm gonna play it for you inshallah now so and then we will move on to discuss the specific parts of it give some introduction how we will approach it and so on as we are used to inshallah okay so uh, bismillah rahman rahim uh, let's play the video really good one so pay close attention inshallah it should be fairly obvious by now to anyone who watches my channel regularly that I approach politics and global affairs from a real politic perspective, which is to say a practical, realistic, objective reading of what's going on and how Muslims should navigate these real world circumstances without ideological blinders. Now, real politic has gotten a bit of a bad name because it is understood to be an amoral approach to politics, removed from ideology or ethics, basically an ends justifies the means mentality. This is more or less the official definition of real politic. And it is the way that most practitioners do it. But of course, anytime you want to achieve a particular goal, that goal is based on an ideologically determined system for prioritization, meaning you cannot remove a belief system or an ideology from what determines what you want to achieve. Specific outcomes are sought because your belief system views those outcomes as good. So, for example, when real politic practitioners prioritize, say, control over markets, security, economic growth or whatever it's because those practitioners ideology regards those things as being of the greatest importance so it's not really true that there is no ideology involved here we have just tended to see amoral ideologies engaging in real politic in my opinion you can utilize the real politic approach for pursuing moral outcomes in fact i think if you are serious about achieving moral outcomes you must take a real politic approach to strategy. And I do not believe that this conflicts with Islam whatsoever. Quite the contrary. From the earliest period, the Muslims balanced ideals against pragmatism, seeking ideal outcomes through pragmatic means. I believe that the Treaty of Hordebiyah was an example of Rasulullah taking a real politic approach, while the emotional reaction of Umar bin al-Khattab to the treaty was purely idealistic. Now, we're not aware that the Prophet ﷺ received any revelation about the treaty until after he had signed it, meaning his decision to agree to it was not a matter ordered by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but it was subsequently heralded by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through Wahi as a victory. Which means that Rasulullah ﷺ evaluated the situation rationally, engaged the potential benefits of entering the treaty, and made his decision on that basis, believing that the sulh was the most practical strategy for pursuing the moral goal of spreading Islam further and easing the difficulties of the Muslims. When the Ahzab were besieging Medina at Khandaq, Rasulullah suggested offering a deal to some of the tribes, including granting them a share of the Muslims' crops in exchange for them severing their alliance with the Quraysh. That was a pragmatic, real politic strategy aimed at relieving the Muslims of the peril that they were facing. When the Sahaba asked him whether or not this resolution was given to him by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or whether it was his own idea, and he said it was his own idea, they expressed their dislike for that compromise. Ultimately, of course, a different real politic strategy was employed to dismantle the siege, basically using what we would now characterize as espionage or sayyad against the tribes uh, in order to cause them to disband the Ahzab. You can also look at the very careful investigations that Rasulullah made around the caravan of the Quraysh before embarking on the Battle of Badr. This also was him taking a real politic approach to decision making. He wanted to have as much objective information as possible about the caravan before deciding to engage. And again, the correctness of his decision was only later confirmed by Wahi. You can even look at his handling of Banu Quraydah to see the real politic approach he took in the absence of revelation. 
This is even more interesting because Rasulullah had been ordered through Wahi to deal with them, but he had not been instructed specifically on how to deal with them. And his appointment of Sa'ad bin Mu'ad to decide their fate was a remarkable stroke of political savvy, reconciling both Banu Quraita and the Aus tribe with the ultimate judgment of Sa'ad. Now it's also claimed, of course, that Sa'ad's judgment was derived from the Torah, which there's no real reason to suppose it was, but it certainly aligned with it, even according to modern rabbinical scholars. And so, since it did in fact align with the Torah, with their scripture, this left Banu Quraida with even less grounds to object to the judgment. This whole episode demonstrates the brilliance of Rasulullah's tactical political acumen. In all three of the instances I mentioned, we see Rasulullah accepting or offering to accept a temporary concession or compromise, or even what might appear to be the surrendering of an authoritative principle. With the Treaty of Hudaybiyah, Rasulullah allowed the document to not refer to him as Rasulullah, but simply as Muhammad bin Abdullah. He allowed for the return of Muslims back to Mecca, who had fled to Medina, and so on. At Khandaq, he basically offered to sacrifice Muslim crops as a payoff to the Hazab. And at Banu Quraida, he allowed someone else to render the judgment, when every Muslim knows that all judgments are to be referred to Allah and His Messenger. But these apparent concessions, these apparent compromises, were pragmatic, real politic maneuvers in which ideology, for lack of a better term, directed what outcomes were sought, but not the strategy on how to achieve them. The strategy for achieving a moral or ideological outcome was left to be determined through a political, military, or economic assessment of what was the most effective given the prevailing circumstances. And I think you can certainly look at the story of Al-Khadr in the Qur'an and see the theory of real politic at work. Al-Khadr did many things which upon first appraisal were highly questionable, if not immoral. But his actions were decisive measures to address issues about which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had made him aware. Now an uncharitable interpretation of the story of Al-Khadr would see it as approving the idea of the ends justifies the means. But I would argue that it simply represents taking a realistic and unidealistic approach to solving problems, confronting dangers, and supporting the common good through objective evaluation and decisive action. Now, there's an old moral teaching about a man passing by a river and suddenly seeing a baby floating past, about to drown in the water. He runs into the river to save the baby, but then he sees another, and another, and another, an endless number of babies floating down the river, all about to drown. Now, another man appears on the shore, and the man in the river cries out to him for help. The man on the shore pauses for a moment, and then starts to walk away. The man in the river shouts at him, where are you going? You have to help me save these babies. The man replies, that's what I'm doing. I'm going to find out where the babies are being placed in the river and stop it. So who was right? The man in the river will certainly be able to save a few babies, but will just as certainly fail to save many. The man on the shore will certainly be able to save many babies, but will just as certainly fail to save a few. But he will bring the problem to a conclusive end. The man in the river represents the moral idealist or ideological approach, while the man on the shore represents the real politic approach of achieving moral ends through objective and unemotional strategy. But of course, the man on the shore is also guilty of literally walking away from drowning babies, whom he could save at that moment if he tried. There's no getting around that fact, but in my opinion, his approach is still superior. I think that we can frame this approach as the moral decision-making equivalent of the decision-making approach of delayed gratification. It's similar to how you choose to sacrifice some form of immediate gratification today for a greater gratification in the future. For example, it's more pleasant to just sit on your couch rather than go to the gym. And going to the gym, of course, won't provide you immediate results anyway. But if you go to the gym instead of sitting on your couch, eventually the outcome is going to be far better for you than the immediate enjoyment of lazy indulgence. This is delayed gratification. Real politique is something like this. You may have to do things that are distasteful to you in the immediate term. Things that even contradict your values, perhaps. But they are necessary if you want to achieve long-term moral outcomes. This is a very hard pill for most people to swallow, and it's not for everyone. Just like the example of the two men and the babies in the river, pursuing immediate moral outcomes 
still involves immoral repercussions. And so does pursuing long-term moral outcomes. But the question is, which is more important in the grand scheme of things? My personal opinion is that the long-term takes precedence. And I believe that Islam validates this view. Look, the dunya is a very rough neighborhood. And it is comprised of rough people, all battling for their interests. If your own life and circumstances are safe and secure and comfortable and easy, that was made possible for you by people who were willing and ruthless and realistic enough to carve it out of impossibility. Idealism can only rightly be a motivating engine for action, but it cannot be used to steer it. Seeking instant moral gratification can too easily become futile self-righteousness that achieves no worldly good except your own sense of being good. Because solving problems and achieving moral outcomes requires patience, sacrifice, compromise, vision, endurance, realism, and yes, ruthless focus and determination. We can think about Abu Dhar al-Dafari, radiallahu anh. He was one of the most pious and most fearless men from among the Sahaba, but also one of the most problematic, difficult, and divisive. Abu Dhar never held his tongue when he felt something was wrong. Whatever he felt or thought he said, regardless of the situation or to whom he was speaking, he was a man who had no attachment to the dunya and was outstandingly courageous. You know, he announced his conversion to Islam publicly before anyone was doing that, and he did it right outside the Kaaba. He was beaten for it, but he went back the next day and did it again, and then he went back again and did it again, and the same thing happened, and every time he was mercilessly beaten. Yet this brave man, with all his strength of character and fearlessness, when he asked Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa to appoint him to a position of leadership, the Prophet Sallallahu refused and told him that he was weak. Now, weakness is not a word that anyone would use to describe someone like Abu Dhar. But the very same qualities that made him great outside of leadership would be weaknesses in leadership because leaders cannot be morally impulsive with no ability to bear what their consciences dislike for the sake of a greater good. Leaders must have the ability to hold their tongue, to be tactful, to be strategic, to consider all contingencies and do what is necessary for the larger goals that it is their job to achieve. Abu Dhar was a man who needed instant moral gratification. He was not a man who knew how to choose his battles. He would battle anyone instantly at the slightest perception of wrong. But a leader must have the wisdom to weigh the magnitude of wrongs to identify which are greater and most dangerous, because the complicated reality of the world is that sometimes tolerating one wrong can prevent a worse one from happening. Moral idealists cannot understand or accept this reality, but again, they have the privilege of being spared from having to understand that because of the hard decisions made by men who do understand it. And here it's important to remind ourselves that good deeds cancel bad deeds. Bad deeds do not cancel good ones. You will meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with every good deed you have ever done. But only with those bad deeds which your good deeds have not been sufficient to negate. Now leaders of states operate on a scale far beyond most people in terms of both their good and bad deeds. And it would be naive to think that the good they achieved for their people did not come at a cost and did not cause the suffering of some or even many. They will have wronged and they will have hurt more people by their decisions and their policies than most of us interact with in our lifetimes. But if they also achieve long-term good and benefit to their people, it will also be far beyond anything we can do in a lifetime of good deeds. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will count it all. The dua of all of those that they may have wronged will be heard. But the safety, the prosperity, and the betterment of the lives they improved will also be seen. And if the wrongs that they committed or tolerated as a necessary evil on the path to a greater long-term good, it seems likely to me that they may be forgiven. I do not know, however, if an idealistic leader who fails to face the realities of the world and who imagines that his moral purity should be sufficient to defeat his nation's enemies, and that his personal goodness is enough as a political strategy for victory, 
And because of this, his nation is inevitably subjugated by those practicing real politic. I don't know if this delusional and negligent approach can be forgiven. Jazakumullahu khairan wa assalamu alaikum. MashaAllah, MashaAllah. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Okay, so, uh, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. Wa salatu wa salamu ala ashraf al-anbiya'i wa al-mursaleen. Habibina wa nabiyina Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Rabbi shrah li sadri wa yassir li amri wa ahlul uqdatan min lisani yafqahu qawri. Okay, so welcome everyone. Happy to see some familiar faces, alhamdulillah. Happy to have you all here. Happy to have my wonderful speakers with me today. So, as you heard from the video, we will today try to dissect and discuss this. You know, it's a kind of an intricate balance, right, that needs to be achieved between some pragmatism and, on the other hand, probably some morality or some ideology, and especially in relation to today's Islamic leadership. Right? So, in the video, there were some historical instances that gave us some lessons in how we can navigate these complexities, uh, especially from the Sira, of course, but today we will try even to look at some instances from the leadership of the Khulafa al-Rashidun, and because, you know, people usually speak about how they want to bring back the Khilafa and that it was the best time ever. I'm not saying these were not some of the best leaders that we have ever had, but there were also instances where people were against some decisions that they deemed as immoral or as controversial. So it really is something that has been since the start, right? It's not something new that leaders need to decide a bit more realistically than just based on emotions or based on what is moral in the short run. So inshallah, we will try to explore this real politique as Brother Shahid called it, and we will try to adopt it, inshallah, from an Islamic perspective, right? Because uh, in the end, everything we view is through this lens. So uh, let us begin, inshallah. So, uh, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Uh, we firstly need to somehow, you know, define what is uh, real politique, right? So, as Brother Shahid mentioned in the video, it is this kind of like... Uh, you know, it can be compared to this uh, philosophical approach where you have, you know, pure realism and pragmatism, that it is somehow like pragmatism in politics, right? Without taking into account any ideological or moral or ethical premises. The, as Brother Shahid also mentioned in the video, this kind of idea that the means justify the ends, right? So this is how we can consider the Western perspective of it. Right. But now we need to somehow define the Islamic perspective of real politique, right? Because it does differ from the Western concept as everything, basically, right? So my first question to my fellow speakers, inshallah, would be how do you think or how do you view the concept of real politique in Islam? How, do you, how does it differ from the more or less secular understanding of the term? Because we cannot divide politique from morality in Islam. But there is some specific balance that needs to be achieved. And yeah, so this would be my first question, inshallah. How do you think that the concept of real politics and Islam differs from the Western secular understanding of that term? So I already see some hands up. It feels like I'm in a class. So, <laughs> brother MG, please feel free. Yeah. Uh, Assalamu alaikum, everyone. So um, for me, this. Uh... Um, this video was very eye-opening and it uh, gave me a lot of self-reflection on uh, one of the reasons why um, as the Arab and Muslim world uh, the last 80 to 100 years um, made me self-reflect on, on, on the amount of uh, opportunities that we uh, uh, squandered. So I, I think with Islamic real politique is that we look more into um, the greater good you know, and uh, that for me is, uh, of course, we are we we our our objective is more on how to improve the well-being of the entire community more than it is on uh, a certain uh, materialistic uh, outcome. So that's in short. Uh, but I'll let, I'll let you continue from the floor. Yeah, mashallah. Exactly, uh, brother Omar, please. Yes, am I audible? Alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah. All right, so I think the point made in the video uh, and uh, the point where we can start 
is that uh, Islamic jurisprudence ever since its you know inception was uh, that you don't have to necessarily be uh, faced with a with a situation where you know the good from the bad, but most probably you will always have to choose the the lesser of two evils, right? So this is where real politic instantly comes in, is that um, it, a society or the, the like the brother Shahid said in the video, the dunya is a rough neighborhood, right? So it's not a, a utopia, meaning that anyone can distinguish between the good and the evil. But uh, as uh, as Khabir al Jalil Omar ibn Khattab said, um, he said in Arabic, al faqihu man alim khayr al sharain. So he said that uh, um, a scholar, a true scholar, is the one who distinguishes the lesser of two evils and calculates which would be more beneficial to the ummah uh, from from a from a strategic long term view. So um, it, and also it has to be mentioned that real politicking, in that sense, is not um, you know. Um, uh, it, it's not just a concern for the rulers. It's a concern for the scholars as well and a concern for society as a whole, meaning that all of them have to be uh, on the same page. All of them have to have um, the, the interests of the ummah uh, in mind and uh, they all have to <clears throat> they all have to be uh, somewhat uh, logical, reasonable. Um, they have to have their moral instant moral gratification, like Brother Sheikh put it. They have to have it at bay. And they should not be uh, so rash to to um, to spill out judgments or to uh, call out uh, uh, um, immorally uh, immoral accusations of of people they don't know uh, uh, the situations they are in and the choices they are facing. So, in a nutshell, Islamic politicking is choosing the lesser of two evils because you're, you're not living in a utopia, and it's not it's not the concern of the rulers only; it's the concern of the scholars play a great role in society and the ummah as well because the ummah should be more educated that's it thank you assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh can you hear me alhamdulillah okay, alhamdulillah uh i just wanted to sort of clarify a couple of things uh one I, I think i tried to clarify that's a very old podcast by the way um but i think i, I tried to clarify it in there that when i was talking about how Real politic, as it's practiced in the West, is uh, deemed as being amoral or, or unideological. Uh, but the reality is that they are following their sense of morality. They're just being honest about it. This is the difference between real politic and every other uh, form of uh, political uh, practitioner, uh, which is that they're simply being honest about the fact uh, that they approach politics in in a way that doesn't really factor in morality. Uh, and this is consistent with uh, the West's uh, deprioritization of morality. And I think, of course, they deprioritize morality because it's not really a concept that they fully understand anyway, and they don't really see the value in it. Uh, so I don't, I, I think that just, just to clarify, uh, I think that real politics simply means uh, approaching politics, approaching policy, approaching strategy in the most effective way possible, uh, according to the moral sense that you have. Uh, so when, when that plays out in the West, it plays out in an amoral or an immoral fashion. But uh, in, the, in the same way, when it plays out among Muslims, it plays out in a moral fashion. Because uh, we are trying to be effective uh, in the most moral way possible, and we're trying to be moral in the most effective way possible. Uh, and so, for example, I would, even, I would even say that we shouldn't use the term or the, uh, the phrase lesser of two evils. We should use more what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala refers to in the Quran, which is to do what's better between the available options. So rather than just saying we're going to pick the lesser of two evils, let's say we're trying to pick what's the better of the available options. Uh, uh, neither of those options may be optimal. Neither of those options may be ideal. But those are the available options. So we choose the better one. That's all. Uh, I think that's, a, that's more of a, a positive way of looking at it. And there's a more Islamic way of looking at it. Uh, and I think that that's uh, really what we mean or what I mean anyway, in terms of an Islamic approach to real politic, and I wish that we had a different phrase for it rather than using the Western phrase real politic, uh, because really what we're talking about is just being effective, trying to be effective. And I, and I personally think that uh, trying to be or trying to achieve moral outcomes in an ineffective way uh, amounts to the same thing as being amoral or immoral, because you're not going to achieve the outcome at the end of the day if you're ineffective. Uh, I'm, I'm reminded of uh, the uh, dua of Umar bin al-Khattab when he said that he sought refuge uh, from the fitna of uh, an incompetent friend uh, and he sought refuge from a competent enemy. So uh, we have to try to approach all of our uh, challenges in the most effective and competent way possible 
Uh, and that means being realistic. That means being practical. That means being pragmatic uh, uh, so that we can be effective to achieve what's better. Uh, rather than saying the lesser of two evils, we're trying to achieve whatever is better according to what is actually possible to achieve. Uh, that's all I wanted to say. Thank you. But, you know, this can be a bit like sometimes, like, again, with the labels of the West, when we use them right, we, you know, it's very difficult to convey the message because it has been tainted by the Western experience of that given word, right, or that given label. So I completely understand the, the term. But we also understand why we use these terms, right? Because it shares some of the apparent meanings, even though the core like understanding of the specific word is probably different. But then, you know, how can leaders nowadays, or especially Muslim and Arab uh, leaders, how can they balance, you know, the, this approach of real politic, but also take into consideration the ethical and, you know, some moral, the, the moral ground of Islam right? without compromising somehow their principles. And I would like to ask, how do we see this approach or this uh, specific strategic approach, right, play out currently? And of course, for all, with respect to Palestine, right? you know, like, yeah, how, you know, in these situations where we have some kind of short term moral compromises and they are, of course, necessary for the greater good, how can the leaders ensure the these compromises do not somehow go against the core values of Islam or become some way of, you know, leading to injustice. Yes, uh, brother uh, MG, please. Yeah, I think the problem is that um, they are working and navigating in a very, very challenging environment and a very, very challenging uh, period of time. Um, this part of the world has not experienced um, this kind of turbulence and this kind of uh, instability uh, probably ever. So they are also dealing as well with a world that is changing rapidly as well, a world that is becoming faster, faster in terms of how information is disseminated, faster in terms of how uh, destruction uh, takes place, and uh, faster in terms of how much uh, resources and uh, and the material wealth is being consumed and used and uh, at the same time fast in the sense of the need to take very quick decisions and very strategic decisions. And so putting that together and factoring in as well that you are dealing also with a population that um, has also uh, over time um, its needs have increased because of how fast the world has uh, advanced. Back in the day, most of the region um, didn't have the same kind of um, needs and resources that we need today. And so keeping up with speed and at the same time uh, trying to stay uh, autonomous and independent, it uh, it is a very, uh, very challenging landscape to uh, to work in. And some of the things that I wish we can look at as subjects or as people that live under under the rulership is to understand that, is to understand that it's very easy to talk about how bad they are or how bad they are functioning because we're not in the driving seat. We're not in their position and making decisions that affect millions of lives. It's not that easy. And... Uh, taking emotional decisions or decisions by what I like to call um, decisions that are supported by people that uh, in Egypt we co coin them as nexageia, which basically means as um, it's a term that uh, describes um, people who are who really mean good and who want to do good, but they are moral idealists, as uh, Shahid said. Uh, they end up taking decisions that irreversibly. Uh, damage uh, their country, damage the Oma, damage uh, the region that they are in. And uh, the word Naksageya comes from the, the Naksa or the catastrophe of 1967 because Nasser, one of the things that he was very famous in was, was saying the things that uh, he was uh, that, that he was uh, he was very famous in saying the things that people like to hear and taking the actions that were popular but were they a lot of the time effective? I would not say so. 
uh, for some time. Some some decisions were very damaging. So this is the term. That's where the term originally comes from. And this is a problem that we've had for eight to ten decades. Is that we are we want we always want people to lead us who 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 say who say the things that we like and who say the thing and do the things that we think is good for us because we want to uh we we want to show and uh, and express our morality in a very confrontational way and so what you would realize is all the all the leaders that were strategic thinkers and strategic decision makers in the history of of the region the last 8 to 10 decades they were not uh, not painted in good light by the arab and the uh, and the Muslim masses. They were called traitors, they were called Zionists, they were called they betrayed the, the Palestinian cause, when in reality um, they bought it they, they bought more time for the cause and they 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 prevented war from spreading into war and destabilization spreading from their into their own countries. And so um, this is kind of the problem that you see. And uh, I always have this thing is that those people that are saying or insinuating that Arab, luder, Arab rulers are serving Israel or they're Zionists are themselves serving Israel. I don't know, brother, maybe there's some problem with the connection or can you hear brother well? No, I think he got disconnected. Oh, okay, yeah, I, I was scared if it's just on my side. Uh... No, we can't hear him as well. Okay, inshallah, while he, he had some very good points, inshallah, that we will uh, try to address, but I saw your hand, Brother Omar, up, so if you want to share some thoughts about that, uh, the question that was asked, inshallah, related to this uh, this intricate balance, right, that, you know, leaders and Brother and G, of course, you know, spoke about some stuff, so if you want to add to that, feel free, inshallah, and, well, Brother MG, inshallah, solves his uh, issues. Okay, so I think, well, first of all, um, uh, a more uh, a more intimate relationship has to exist between scholars and uh, the rulers, uh, because the scholars, at the end of the day, they know um, uh, what what might be beneficial to the ummah in terms of uh, the society and how society will benefit, or at least they can be uh, uh, consulted on matters of the jurisprudence and the laws that can be made uh, to ensure the greater good or uh, the lesser evil, uh, in, in in the sense that. The, the, the achieving the goal that's necessary. Uh, so uh, as Brother Shahid has, has been clarifying that uh, the, the goal necessary may be the lesser of two evils or maybe the greater good, so uh, in whichever case. So the, the, the relationship between the rulers and the scholars has to be uh, very intimate. And I also think that um, uh, the rulers also need to have person uh, uh, people of expertise in different uh, fields, meaning that they shouldn't only consult the scholars, but they should also consult um, academics uh, with regards to what would happen in the long term if uh, if a, a certain law is passed or a certain war is waged or uh, a certain city is built or a certain a canal has been paved, all of these you know uh, state um, actions or state uh, prerogatives, these uh, are in in the end affecting the ummah and affecting the society. So you need both um, the, the 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 scholars to tell you that uh, this would be of uh, of um, of, a, of relation to a core Islamic value or not, and you need the academics to know which would be the most effective way to reach that goal within uh, the framework or within the uh, um, the outlines uh, that have been outlined by the scholars. Um, so, yeah, I, I think uh, it can be achieved that way if uh, if, uh, if both of them are uh, consulted. And uh, let's bear in mind that Imam Abu Hanifa, the very first. Uh, uh, imam of the, the jurisprudence schools in Islam, he held an academy in his uh, mosque where he taught fiqh or Islamic jurisprudence and he consulted with academics. He didn't only consult with uh, uh, Islamic scho um, uh, religious scholars, he consulted with academics because he wanted to know how the laws that were being put would affect society from a technical point of view in the long term. So I, I, I hope that answers the question. Thank you. Um, it, 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 I know, I know, uh, brother had had more to say, MG. But let me just, uh, if you don't mind, sort of jump in for a second. I think that it's important when we're talking about states, when we're talking about uh, governments and countries and so on. Uh, it's good to remember that uh, states don't have a lifespan. It's not like an individual. On an individual basis, all of our moral decisions and our moral outcomes take place within a span of 
you know, maybe 70, 80 years. Uh, it's a very short term. The, the, the decisions that we have to make are very, by nature, short term decisions because our life itself is short term. But that's not the case with states. That's not the case with nations. Nations don't have a lifespan. They don't have a point at which they are going to die uh, and, and be judged. They have to make. And so, so the people who are in charge of nations, the people who are in charge of states, they themselves are, of course, individuals and they have a lifespan. But they have to make decisions on the basis of uh, years and generations ahead. They have to think about the, the total uh, long term vision for their nation, for their state, for their country, for their people. That's not a thing that individuals have to do. So we have a kind of a privilege or we have a kind of a, uh, an advantage in that uh, we can be more uh, short term moral thinkers than the leaders of nations can be. The leaders of nations have to think about uh, sometimes what the moral outcome is going to be uh, a generation from now or two generations or three generations from now. They need to think about, I mean, if you if, if like a good way to compare it, maybe is, for example, if there's a if there's a conflict. Uh, and let's say the the solution to that conflict, uh, I have uh, potentially the solution to intervene in that conflict because I have a weapon. Say I have a gun uh, and I'm supposed to now intervene in that conflict because I have a gun. However, I have no bullets. So I have to go through this process of either uh, purchasing bullets, finding bullets uh, and then loading my gun and, and so forth. I have to go through all of this process so that I can do what you think I can already do. But I, I, there's a whole process that I have to go through before I'm actually ready to do the thing that you need me to do. Uh, and so it may look like I'm not intervening. It may look like I'm doing nothing while I'm trying to find the ammunition for my weapon. But I'm actually in the process of trying to solve this problem. But it takes time. Uh, and uh, uh, this is how it works with, with nations. I mean, if you think about like a, a, a policy for a country, say, for example, um, developing their economy. Uh, developing uh, uh, or, or shifting the core focus of their economy. For example, uh, they start implementing policies. Say they start implementing policies right now. You're not going to see the impact of that for 10 years. 10 or 15 years down the line, you'll see the, the outcome for the decisions that were made in 2024. You're not going to see it until uh, 2035 or 2040. Uh, and people today uh, might look at it and say, well, this person, this leader or that leader is, is doing nothing. Uh, this ruler is doing nothing. But they're making decisions that have long term impact. Uh, maybe we won't even live to see that impact. And maybe the ruler or the, uh, the leader himself or herself may not live to see the impact. They themselves may not live to see the outcome, but they're making decisions uh, on the basis of the uh, uh, potentially limitless lifespan of their nation, rather than making decisions on the basis of their own lifespan or the lifespan of the people who they are individually ruling right now in the present. So you have to make decisions and you have to uh, uh, implement policies uh, with a long term vision in mind. And that means a long term moral outcome, which between the uh, outstart of that policy and the outcome of that policy, there may be years, there may be decades, there may be generations. But these are the these are, this is the approach that uh, responsible leaders have to make. Now, in the meantime, of course, they do have to deal with uh, emergency situations, crisis situations and what have you. Uh, but their approach to those things is always going to depend upon uh, their, again, their available options. And, and they may be working on, uh, uh, they may be working on strategies for increasing the available options for the next ruler or the next ruler or the next ruler. So that, so that generations down the line, uh, the people of their nation will have more options available to them than the people uh, who are living right now. So I think that that's, that's also a very important thing to remember when we're talking about uh, so-called so real politic in that, for, for leaders, for nations, this is a very long-term scenario. They have to make decisions in, in, in a way that, uh, as I say, we may not even see the moral outcome, but they're making decisions that can have a moral outcome, that have the intention of having a moral outcome, that they simply do not have the ability to achieve right now in our lifetime. I think it's important to remember that. Yes, just like a lot, brother. Um, I will just continue with the, what you've just said about um, the long-term vision that... Uh, 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 leaders, Muslim or Arab leaders, uh, need to follow. Well, we'll have to uh, look into because um, uh, it's first of all the Islamic principles. Uh, it ground grounding them and looking into real uh, politics uh, would force them into a long term vision. And one more thing: in some of those uh, Muslim countries, uh, their political system encouraged long term uh, long term planning. It's not a short term who gets into the office. 
um, how can I say, system where they have to only focus on the short term, short term and what people need to hear to get into that seat, uh, but also because it's um, a stable system where um, if not them, it's their, uh, uh, their prodigy, their, um, their uh, family line that is going to be uh, ruling that, uh, that place. And therefore, it, it, it encourages them to look into the long-term vision uh, overall. Uh, I'm just looking at it from this, this perspective that um, the long-term uh, vision rooted in ethics or in, rooted in Islamic uh, principles is uh, encouraging in such kind of uh, political systems. Um, on another thing, uh, we also that um, one of the what can Arab leaders do uh, to balance real politics on the question of that. I think the what they are doing now, which is the promote promoting um, unity with within the Ummah, within the uh, other Muslim uh, nations. Uh, as you mentioned, Brother Shahid, in the, your latest uh, one of the latest videos, how there is um, there has never been this kind of unity at a state level at a as um, a national level among the Muslim uh, states and how that uh, is actually uh, uh, plays well into uh, the real politic and also uh, the, the, um, uh, what we're trying to achieve in terms of our uh, principle, Islamic principles. So um, these are things that the uh, Muslim or Arab leaders uh, are doing and we, that the people need um, uh, support, well, people need to support them. As Brother MJ mentioned, it's not an easy uh, environment to, uh, to be a leader when uh, most of your public are uh, exposed to a lot of propaganda against those leaders. And there are many examples that we will probably uh, later on state on how the public is not really helping in that matter, in that, in that arena, but there are, uh, real politics, understanding real politics from the Sira and from um, uh, and, and, and from other uh, resources and even from what is going on now in, in our Ummah, in, our, in, in the world, is something that we are trying here in Middle Nation and also with this content talk, uh, trying to uh, spread among the people to, to see it from a different, different perspective and not necessarily what you hear, like you have, people have to, um, you know, uh, think or critically think about what they are hearing and just not accept it, not absorb everything that is out there. Uh, and why just think, I mean, we see so many um, uh, media posts and uh, all, all over the social media about how other people, we let other people judge our environment or tell us about all, our own environment, or, which is really scary uh, and to believe them and to go ahead and even it's like self-defeating, yet there are other people, other uh, uh, sector of uh, our, our people that are trying to correct that and trying to uh, 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 show them that, well, we, there is no need to look into the outside. We don't need any uh, other people to tell us what is going on in our environment. We need, the, what I'm trying to say is there is awareness of this kind of um, propaganda that is out there, which is a good sign. But we still need to work on and to help the um, Arab or Muslim or uh, our leaders, our environment, our people, our scholars um, in that matter. We need to look into ourselves uh, um, uh, most, most importantly, and that would definitely uh, help us uh, in gaining our ultimate goal of unity within the Ummah, inshallah. MashaAllah, uh, one key, like, thank you very much, sister. But there was this one key point that you and uh, Brother Shahid mentioned, which, in my opinion, is like the striking difference with the Western approach to real politics, which is especially about this short term sightedness. Like, you know, Brother Shahid mentioned in many videos before, the politic, politics in the West are basically, you know, they say what people want to hear, and then they make policies or they adopt policies for business just to be able to secure a place in the business right and that's all they care about they do not care about the people they do not care what will come after and we can see this in different policies when you see how they approach it and yeah, subhanallah this is very key difference and then you know leaders like for example china when they have these five-year plans for the economy it is then criticized as being you know central planning or when arab leaders do it etc so very interesting distinction and i'm very happy that you highlighted it because i think this is one of the major differences and you know one of the key pluses of the governments outside of the west 
that they really try to think about this continuity, right? Like what comes after me is my responsibility as well of the policies that I do now. And, you know, in economics, it takes time for the policies to take effect through the economy, through when the subjects try to adopt to these policies, how they shift their behavior, even producers, consumers, etc. So it's very important to take into account these consequences of the policies and not just do whatever it takes me to get into business, to get this position, and you know, whatever comes after, I don't care, right? And people usually tend to assess, like, uh, the immediate uh, consequences, and they do not see that, for example, the second term, it's already the consequence of the policies of your previous president, right? So people usually just ascribe an outcome that is now happening to the current presidency or to the current uh, party that is in the parliament, for example, or whatever field they might be in, the ones who are deciding now, but they do not see that it's a legacy, right? Like the outcomes that you have now is mostly due to the policies that were enacted in the previous term, right? And yeah, this is very important, I think, for people to realize that if your economy is doing well now, it does not have to be because of the steps that your current leader did, but try to look at the previous four years, what was being done, right? And the same if it's negative, it's not due to the current leader, it's probably because of the previous leader, right? And uh, also, I would like to tie back, sorry, just for this, uh, you know, <laughs> step aside, I would try to, you spoke about, and Brother MG was speaking about before it cut off, about, you know, the, this narrative that is usually being brought up, right, with, especially, of course, Western Muslims, but we see it even among some people in our Ummah, that the Arab governments are basically sellouts, and they work for the Zionist regime, and that's about it, right? That's the narrative. So I want to ask what possible proofs can we offer to negate this Bezos critique, right? And how can we expose this Zionist propaganda? And so, Brother MG, please continue where we left off if you want to and just take into consideration these two questions, right? We try to give some idea, like, how naive it is to believe that stupid nonsense, right? Because it really is a baseless propaganda. Right? So. Yeah, so... Um... From my, basically my opinion is that anyone that is saying or insinuating that Arab rulers are somehow serving Israel or are themselves, or or um, or are themselves one the ones serving Israel, I would always say that they are the ones that are serving Israel. The ones that are saying that, they're the ones that are saying Israel. They have a stake in saying that. For example, take for example uh, the book called War by Bob Woodward. I mean, we know that Bob Woodward was worked with the Bush administration and he helped uh, draft strategic plans to invade Iraq. So you are going to listen to him about what he says about Arab leaders. By the way, he wrote that book and he probably knows that the biggest customers and readers of this book will come from the Arab and Muslim world. He knows very well that we will read this and we will say, oh, see, you know, uh, our leaders are Zionists. They say that they're Zionists. Of course, it's not true. And so he is actually he wrote this book with a strategic purpose. And the strategic purpose is to destabilize, is to use us as the masses to destabilize the, to destabilize our own countries and our own regions. And they've done it. They've done it uh, before. They've done it with Syria. They've done it with Libya. They've done it with uh, Lebanon. They've done it with uh, Yemen. They've done it with Sudan. And they even done it with, with, the, with, with, the, with the Palestinian, with the Palestinians. Uh, through the PLO and carving it up into two, di two different factions. And that is a major, major problem. And it's something that we really have to be attentive to. Um, and they're trying to do it. They're trying to destabilize Jordan and they are trying to destabilize Egypt. They're trying to use that. They're trying to use these same tactics. Like, for example, with the, with the, Israeli, sh uh, with the Israeli worship that crossed the Suez Canal. Okay. Uh, you saw all the Ikhwan media go berserk about it. But again, they are playing into... The emotions of they are playing into our emotions and the emotions of our masses that we want to do something and of course as masses we don't hold the same responsibility that rulers hold so we are by nature naxageya so naxageya basically i think I, I mentioned it before that naxageya basically comes from uh, um, uh, the naxa or the catastrophe the catastrophe of 1967 the six-day war when uh, when when israel attacks uh, when, when Israel uh, provoked a response and then they uh, they in, they attacked and invaded all the neighboring uh, Arab countries. So an Aksagi is someone who really wants to do good but takes strategically detrimental actions. And they want to push us, they want to push the Muslim world to take these strategic detrimental actions to satisfy their own emotional, our own emo emotional 
um, uh, cravings. And we have to be careful. We need we need the leaders that are wise and who act surgically, not act reactionary. Mashallah, thank you very much, brother. Uh, brother. Uh... Um, oh, okay. if, 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 yeah, sorry, sorry, uh, sorry to sort of just uh, impose myself, but uh, when someone says that the Arab rulers are Zionists, uh, the very simple debunking of that uh, is the fact, I mean, it, okay, if that was true, let's just say that if that was true, then please explain to me uh, why uh, Sinai isn't full of Palestinians right now. Why is that? If, if, if say, uh, Sisi is a Zionist, then why why did he not uh, fill Sinai with the Palestinians when he was asked to do so? When he was told to do so by Anthony Blinken and by Joe Biden and by Netanyahu, if they're all working together, then why didn't he just follow orders? Explain that. Why aren't, why isn't uh, Jordan now, why isn't, hasn't the West Bank been completely cleared of Palestinians and they're all sent into Jordan? Explain it to me. If they're all in one team, then that would be a very easy thing to do. Why is that? Why, why did why why has Qatar been the one funding uh, the Hamas administration ever since they took power in Gaza? Why has why has that uh, administration, the Hamas administration, been allowed to continue by the funding of uh, of uh, Qatar for all these years? Why is that? If they're all working together, Yani, I mean, just explain it. Explain it in some way. What's that? Was it? If your explanation is that if they were to do that, they would have a revolution. Well, we've seen that they know very well how to deal with uh, uh, uprisings. They dealt with the uprisings, uh, the, the potential of uprisings uh, in the Arab Spring. They dealt with that very well. They know they know exactly how. I mean, even according to you, they're all dictators, right? They're all dictators and totalitarian and authoritarian and so forth. So they can easily clamp down on their population uh, and, and uh, uh, avert any uprising against them, uh, popular uprising. They've done it before. Uh, and according to you, they have no hesitation in doing it. They have no hesitation in massacring their own populations and whatnot. And, uh, everything that uh, that all of the propaganda against the Arab rulers. So you can't reconcile these things that your belief that they have total power over their population, total uh, coercive, violent, authoritarian power over their populations, and also that they're uh, afraid of being toppled uh, by uh, some sort of a democratic uprising if they went along and uh, followed the Zionist orders. It doesn't make any sense. And then it also doesn't make any sense that if they are Zionists and completely on board with the Zionists, then why are they not actually accommodating the Zionists? What's the possible explanation for that? Why are they not accommodating them? Why is MBS, for example, going all around Europe trying to get people on board with recognizing a Palestinian state? Why? Why, why, why did they uh, initiate the ceasefire? The, the very first ceasefire resolution uh, at the UN was, was uh, started or was uh, submitted by the United Arab Emirates. Why is that? Why, why, why all of the actions that they're actually taking uh, uh, themselves, except that, uh, okay, all of the actions that they're taking debunk the claim that they're Zionists. But uh, the people who make the claim that they're Zionists aren't even aware of the actions that they're taking. And then even if, if they become aware, if they're told, if they're educated in any way, informed about the actions that the Arab governments are taking, well, they'll just come up with some kind of a spin uh, to make their uh, uh, uninformed opinion seem true, which just shows that you have the need to believe this about the Arab governments, even though there is no uh, action on the ground, there's no action and there's no policy being taken by any of those governments that supports your opinion, which just goes back to what MG said, which is that the people who are spreading this kind of propaganda are themselves uh, actually in cahoots with the Zionists. They themselves are the ones who are cooperating and collaborating with the Zionists uh, because the, the, the Arab countries are the strongest in standing against the Zionists right now. And they're united and the, uh, the solidarity uh, like uh, Sister Samira was saying, the solidarity between the Arab governments isn't something that we have seen in my lifetime, and I'm 53 years old. We haven't seen it in half a century, the, the level of solidarity and unity, uh, and the level of defiance of the United States. The, the, the level of defiance against the United States, against the West, is not something that any of us have seen in my lifetime, except for uh, one or two uh, Arab rulers, like, for example, Qaddafi or Saddam at one point, after he had been uh, 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 an ally of the United States, one or two Arab rulers, uh, maybe in, in my lifetime, were defiant uh, against the West, and we saw what happened to them. And I think that the Arab rulers have learned from that, and they've learned that there's uh, strength in numbers, there's strength in solidarity, and they are uh, actually uh, manifesting solidarity now. Uh, now, you can be uh, uh, critical 
because you don't know uh, anything about what their available options are and what their uh, actual resources are, you don't really know. Because uh, most of the people who make this kind of a claim about the Arab rulers uh, only even heard about Gaza on October 7th. They only even started to care about Palestine on October 7th, and they don't know anything about the history. They don't know anything even about uh, uh, the, the, the first Gulf War, the second Gulf War. They don't know anything about the shock and awe campaign. They certainly don't know anything about 1967. Uh, they don't know anything about uh, 1956. They don't know anything about the actual history in the context of the region. Uh, but if you, if you uh, actually look at what the Arab states are doing, it's actually incredibly impressive, and they deserve a lot of credit for what they're doing, because as I said, they are in defiance of the West. I've talked about it so many times. The way they've treated Anthony Blinken, just kicking him from pillar to post every time he comes to the Middle East, uh, uh, getting doors slammed in his face, uh, that's un that was unthinkable in the 90s. That was unthinkable uh, in the 2000s. That was unthinkable during the so-called global war on terror. You couldn't possibly defy the United States in those days. But now we're seeing them defy it. Uh, so I would really love to have someone explain to me how uh, these these countries that are not capitulating in any way whatsoever, that are not accommodating the Zionists in any way whatsoever, how exactly they are Zionists when what they could do is follow orders. That's what you would expect them to do. If they're actually Zionists, then you would expect them to follow orders, not defy orders. So I would love to get someone to explain that to me. Yeah, I mean, it would have been very easy, very, very easy, if they were on board with everything, to just open the borders, let every single Palestinian or as many Palestinians as they could inside, and it would have been sold, and it would have been sold so easily to the entire world of media that uh, you know uh, uh, were that that these rulers are such humanitarians and that they are doing so many uh, that they're saving the Palestinians from being killed and 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 it would have been sold into the Ikhwan media before any other kind of media. And, uh, you know, at the end of the day, what uh, what you can see also is that um, a lot of the uh, a lot of the issues uh, that that we that the that the that, uh, the Arab world has seen and that how the Arab rulers are navigating through this is because of collective experience. It's because of the collective experience of the past 10 decades. I mean, the the, the Suez War of, uh, of 1956, it was because of the Suez Canal and because there were uh, rash decisions that were taken uh, to try to block uh, because because of people they wanted to to block ships from crossing the Suez Canal. So that that was a price that we could have paid very hard. 1967 also. So yeah, we we have to look at things from 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 a broader range of context. And unfortunately, for many people in the Arab and Muslim world, we only see still from that part. Yeah, we only see from uh, from a very limited viewpoint, and we need to change that. Uh, Brother Nail, I saw your hand raised up. Please uh, feel free to add anything you want. Assalamu alaikum. Can you hear me? Wa alaikum assalam. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Happy to have you here with us. Okay, fantastic. Um, yeah, going back to your question about uh, combating the, the propaganda. Um, you know, back in the day, and I, I kind of remember that um, not particularly clearly, but when there was a big fuss about uh, Turkey and uh, Erdogan. I think that was 2015, I want to say, or 14, uh, the, the failed coup uh, that you know, um, the, the Americans wanted to, to, to instigate. Um, I, I, do, I do remember a lot of Muslims falling for the propaganda that because you know a Muslim leader is not perfect, because he's, he's made some mistakes, now we as moral actors, you know, because, you know, apparently we, we care about the values and we, we care about the truth and whatnot, now we, we have to topple him. While I think a year later, yeah, I, I remember that correctly, a lot of, like, uh, Muslim liberals supported a war criminal uh, named Hillary Clinton. So I, I just want to ask them, do you not realize that these people, the, you know, the, the US, the, the UK, Germany, Italy, etc., they're the descendants of the Crusaders. You know, they know every trick in the book how to divide your countries and your peoples. Like, do you think for a second they don't have any schemes to, to topple your governments and to cause instability in your countries? And on top of that, why don't you hear anybody, anybody advocate? for a so-called revolution in the United Kingdom, in Germany, in the United States. 
I mean, they are the perpetrators of the genocide, my mind you. They are sending weapons, they are providing political cover, and their propaganda apparatus is working non-stop. Why don't you advocate for blood and terror and bloodshed and, you know, all the chaos in their countries? Because, you know, you think that just because you have bogus elections and the power gets transferred from one, you know, pawn to another, then somehow you, you, you have a change and you have a civil society and whatnot. While the genocide is being perpetrated by them. So we, we kind of have to, I will agree as Muslims, and you know, hopefully, you know, non Muslims who are listening to this, you know, we don't want to offend you, okay? But your countries are the real culprits here. It's not ours, I'm sorry. I mean, we are the, we're the prisoners of, of your system and your power. And just going back to the issue of real politic, right? I mean, we see how the Americans are doing it. You know, they, they are able to kill children and they say, you know, war on terror, uh, collateral damage, and everybody moves on. You know, that's their version of real politic. Again, we, we have to be smarter than that. We, we have to avoid as much as bloodshed as, as we can and just, you know, move away from this ridiculous narrative. That the, the the systems they have in the West are somehow superior, and we we have to you know uh, bend our knees to them and accept their rules of play. I mean, at the end of the day, that's not you know that's not part of our religion. We have our like uh, brother uh, or woman, I think he, he mentioned about uh, Islamic jurisprudence, right? How our scholars, you know, were very careful, were careful to craft. Laws and you know, regulations, you know, suggestions, because we're trying to navigate the difficulties of our times. And today, the difficulties are numerous, obviously, but you cannot just expect to, to have simplistic thinking and, and expect, you know, the, the liberation of Palestine and our lands. I'm sorry, that's not, not how it works. That's not the real world. And if you continue falling for the trap, or, you know, the so-called Western uh, values and human rights and, you know, all that nonsense, then you're just an agent of the West because, once again, this is how they do it. This is how they do it. I mean, they know every trick in the book. They've been doing it for, for centuries. And just because you're not aware of it, it doesn't mean it doesn't exist. So, you know, to our Muslim brothers and sisters, especially in Muslim diaspora, on the outskirts of, of the Ummah, you have to wake up. I mean, it is high time you woke up and you, you have to stand in solidarity with, with the rest of us. And look, no human being is perfect. Just because, you know, we approve of the actions of this leader or that leader and we try to, to, to be a solid as a block, it doesn't mean everybody's perfect, man. I mean, everybody makes mistakes. But are you going to say that the leaders in the West are perfect? What's that logic? What's that logic? I'm sorry. So, I, I mean, at the end of the day, we, we kind of have to realize that we're dealing with a very powerful and cunning enemy. And we have to treat him as such. We, we, we cannot expect to, you know, to be naive and to keep falling for the same trick over and over again. Yeah, that's all I, I wanted to add. Thank you. Yeah, Brother Nail, you're absolutely right. I mean, uh, this, is, this, this sort of shows that uh, everyone understands realpolitik because uh, it has to do with the, the, the consequences of taking unrealistic actions. And you're uh, in the West, you're not willing to do that yourself. But you uh, have unrealistic, idealistic demands of everyone else. You have unrealistic, idealistic demands of the Arab world. You have unrealistic, idealistic demands of the Arab rulers, of the, of the, uh, the, the Muslims in the, in the Muslim world. But you yourselves over there in the West don't apply those same idealistic, unrealistic demands to your own selves, even though you're standing there right next to the people uh, who are funding and arming and enabling and committing the genocide. You're right there. It's your country in America. That's your country that's doing it. Uh, you're, you're a, a taxpayer, you're over there. If you think, for example, just like what Brother Nigel said, you think, for example, that they're supposed to overthrow MBS, they're supposed to overthrow uh, King Abdullah, they're supposed to overthrow uh, 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 anyone else in, in the UAE or wherever else, uh, uh, they're supposed to overthrow Sisi, they're supposed to do all of these things. Meanwhile, 
All you're supposed to do is vote for Kamala or Trump. All you're supposed to do is not buy a latte from Starbucks. That's all that, that, that we can ask of you, even though you're the ones who are committing the genocide. It's being done with your money. It's being done uh, by your governments in, the, in, the, in America, in the UK, in Europe, and so on. Uh, and you're not doing anything about it that's even remotely close to what you think that the Arabs are supposed to do about it, what the Muslims in the Muslim world are supposed to do, it, do about it. You don't apply these same standards to yourselves. And like I said in, in a recent video, you keep talking to us, you keep telling us about all the guns you have and about how the, the, uh, America is on the verge of a civil war or on the verge of a revolution because you're all armed to the teeth. Well, where's the action then? You have all these weapons. We don't have those. The, uh, the Muslims in Egypt don't have them. Muslims in Jordan don't have them. Muslims in Saudi Arabia don't have them. Muslims in uh, uh, UAE don't have them. But you have them. And uh, the, the UAE isn't committing the genocide. Saudi Arabia isn't committing the genocide. Egypt isn't committing the genocide. Jordan isn't committing the genocide. Uh, but you want us to overthrow those governments with no weapons. Meanwhile, your government is committing the genocide and you're armed to the teeth. But you don't do anything about it. Why? Because it's unrealistic and insane. You would never do that. And you know perfectly well that it's unrealistic and insane. So you would never do it in your country. But you seem to make this demand upon all of the Muslims in the Muslim world, in the Arab world, that they're supposed to do that, regardless of the consequences, regardless of uh, uh, the ramifications and the repercussions of taking such an action like that, which would, of course, be absolute chaos and anarchy uh, and devastation. Uh, uh, but uh, when it comes to you, it's unthinkable that you would ever do it, except to just talk about it, to just boast about it like it's something that you are even capable of doing. But you know perfectly well that you're never going to do that. And like I said, you shouldn't do that because it would be insane. But you, but you apply these insane idealistic standards to Muslims in the Muslim world and asking them and expecting them and demanding them and criticizing them for not doing uh, these unrealistic, uh, crazy demands that you have, these uh, crazy moral demands that you have that you think that they're supposed to do. Uh, and, and as I say, if they did those things, if they were even able to do those things, you're not going to face the consequences of that. But you, but you make these demands upon them that you would never make upon yourself, and that's because, again, you, you yourselves have been so westernized and so colonized in your mind and in your, in your psyche that you've normalized double standards to where you think it's normal because that's, the, that's a, a hallmark uh, of the West is double standards, and now you've internalized it yourself and think that it's possible uh, and acceptable and proper uh, and moral to make moral uh, demands on other people that you would never make upon yourself, and that's a very, very characteristic Western quality. Yeah, exactly. Mashallah, like people will, you know, literally like even Muslims, they will hate Muslim leaders more and accuse them of worse crimes than they do with Kufar leaders. You know, like make that make sense. I, I don't get it. And subhanallah, you know, they have Muslim about uh, Kufar and Kufar leaders, <laughs> whereas they cannot have that with Muslim leaders. Like, you know, how does this make sense? Uh, I do not know. Subhanallah. And, you know, another thing that you mentioned, do people realize who we are facing? You know, the government that have destroyed nations, that have toppled government, that have just caused massive corruption everywhere they went. Like, do they know what are the repercussions of possibly facing them in, in the state that we are in? Like, I, I do not get these things, right? It's, I mean, subhanallah. And even if we had the power and so on, right? Like, are we the ones who are going to just do the same that they are doing? Yani, subhanAllah, even look at the, again, as you mentioned in the video, right, these Sira events and subhanAllah with the opening of Mecca, right? Look at the approach of the Muslims, look at the approach of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And these were people who hurt them, who tortured them, right? It's not even, you know, about torturing your brothers and so on. This is something that happened literally to you, your personal experience with, you know, the Mushrikeen and Kuffar. But, and subhanAllah, again, the Prophet prioritized reconciliation, trying to approach it through diplomatic means to prevent further bloodshed, right? And it again sets a precedence for what we are all about, right? Uh, there, were, there were people there, like we know even now that not every single Israeli is for what is happening, you know? Like we are in no way saying that what is happening is, you know, something other than atrocious and horrible. And we are, alhamdulillah, you know, through the A6 campaign and different means and through the education that Brother Shahid is providing, trying to decolonize from the Western narratives that are, but understand that there are people, you know, like, does it make sense what you are asking of today's Arab leaders? Do, does it make realistic, practical sense? You mentioned about Israelis. Yeah. Uh, uh, look, yeah. At the look, look at the protests that are, that are happening in Israel right now. They were, they were storming Netanyahu's own house. And what are you all doing in, in, in America? 
the, the Israelis themselves are storming the house of Netanyahu and, and uh, people in America are doing what exactly? You know, this, this unrealistic expectation of others uh, uh, and not applying it to yourself shows that you actually do understand real politique when it comes to you. But when it comes to others, you expect a moralistic, uh, idealistic, unrealistic uh, uh, strategy or, or uh, approach. But you don't apply it to yourself. Like, like think about it this way: if you, if, if, uh, say, I'm living in a in a in a dilapidated building, uh, people in people in America in the cities, you'll understand this reference. I'm living in a dilapidated building uh, somewhere in a in an urban center, and it's owned by a slumlord, and he makes my life a living hell. There's no no uh, repairs. There's no fixing. The plumbing doesn't work. The lights don't work. The electricity doesn't work. On and on and on. Uh, and he keeps uh, raising the rent. Right. So I'm being abused and misused and mistreated by this slumlord. Now I come to you uh, uh, and ask you, can you beat this guy up for me so he'll stop uh, uh, treating me this way? Can you just come and beat this guy up for me? OK, you think it through and realize what will happen to you if you do that. You'll go to jail uh, and he'll still be the slumlord. So that's that, that's not solving my problem. So instead uh, of doing that, instead of going uh, uh, according to my uh, ignorant, short term, emotional wishes, let's say you get a second job or you get another job or you get a higher paying job that allows you to uh, uh, qualify for a loan. You qualify by that loan and you start paying on that loan uh, and you use that loan to buy the building from the slumlord. Now you're the, the owner of that building. Now, all that time is a process that takes a long time. You go through all of those steps and it takes a long time. And that entire time, I'm thinking to myself that you're doing nothing to help me. I'm thinking to myself that you've abandoned me and you're ignoring my plight. Uh, and maybe I'm even criticizing you. But that entire time you were helping me. Uh, but I have to wait for that moral outcome to take place because you've taken responsible, realistic steps to actually solve my problem, as opposed to doing the thing that I wanted you to do, because the thing that I wanted you to do would maybe make me feel better momentarily, but it wouldn't actually solve my problem. So people people can understand real politique uh, and uh, uh, trying to achieve moral outcomes through effective, patient, uh, practical action uh, when it comes to uh, uh, themselves, when it comes to consequences for themselves. Uh, but you don't apply it to others. And this is a, a, a very serious mistake. And if you're unable to do that, then at least, at least uh, you should keep your mouth shut uh, and not uh, criticize people when you don't even understand what the situation is, knowing perfectly well, as I said, that you wouldn't apply these same idealistic, unrealistic standards to yourself uh, uh, and you are applying it to others. So uh, you should at least remain silent if you don't understand what you're talking about and have anything useful to say. Exactly, mashallah. And I, you know, and subhanAllah, do you understand the repercussions of what you are asking? Again, this point, right? Yeah. Just, I just wanted to mention this in uh, in relation to opening of Mecca. Yeah, if you just try to see the similarities of the Quraysh and what kind of people they were and what they were doing and look at what is currently happening and the approach of the Muslims and the Prophet in, وسلم, himself, yeah, subhanAllah, and even Allah, you know, in the Quran, he revealed and you know, these they are the ones who disbelieve and they are the ones who stop you from entering the sacred mosque. And then Walaula Rijalum Muminuna when is Minatin Lamta Alamuhum and Tata Uhum Fatusi Bukum Minhum Marlotum Bivaira in you know, like you might have trampled them underfoot, right? Like we would have let you march to Mecca had there not been believing men and believing women unknown to you. You know, you might have trampled them under foot, foot, under your foot, incurring guilt for what you did to them unknowingly. That was so Allah may admit into his mercy, whoever so he wills. Right? So you do not know who is there. And we are not going to take the same approach that the kuffar are taking against us. Right? You know, you know, try to decolonize from this Western mentality that might is right. We are trying to achieve it in the best manner possible, the best outcome possible, inshallah. So, yani, please understand what is being done and how serious the steps that are being done are. Okay, so inshallah, I hope, you know, people realize that, that, that even the people who went, you know, like, of course, you can imagine with Western Muslims, they would be calling, you know, for the annihilation of all Quraysh and Meccans and just bomb it, right? Uh, 
to understand that the best human being to have ever lived, Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and all the people around him, they were treated in the most inhumane possible manner. They were subject to torture, but they forgave and they understood why they were doing it. Of course, you know because Allah said so. He said that it's better to forgive. But secondly, because this approach has a repercussion on the heart, it has a repercussion on politics, on the geopolitics of Arabia as a whole. So try to listen and learn from the best human being that ever lived, because there are like incountable lessons that one can learn and apply them, inshallah, to today's world. So, yeah, subhanAllah, I just wanted to add this point. Sorry. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, th this actually, what you just mentioned sort of brings up a, a nice way maybe to uh, explain the difference between uh, sort of Western realpolitik and Islamic realpolitik. Because, uh, like, on the one hand, you said uh, that there would be some people who are the very idealistic, uh, unrealistic people who would say, well, yeah, they should just attack the Quraysh and, and, you know, slaughter them and what have you. And, you know, uh, even without that order having been given by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to fight them, uh, they, they would think that well, that's what you're supposed to do. But then there's another, this is the, this, this would be the Western realpolitik uh, perspective because the Quraysh offered to Rasulullah to become the king if he would just agree to allow uh, shirk. If he would, if he would stop with uh, Tawheed. They would allow him to be a king. They would give him all the money he wanted. They would give him all the power he wanted and so on. So according to the Western realpolitik, uh, they would say, yeah, you should do that. He should have taken the deal. He should have made that, that trade-off uh, and exchanged uh, uh, power for Tawheed. Uh, but because his, his position was an Islamic realpolitik position, that's an unacceptable trade-off. Because we have, a, we have, a, we, when we engage in politics, when we engage in any sort of a strategy, it is uh, uh, intended for a moral outcome, and that would not have been a moral outcome, according to the West. That would have been a moral outcome because their only moral is power, power and money. Uh, but uh, when when uh, you have Islamic moral outcomes that you're trying to work for, uh, then you do try to use effective strategy, and that's the real politic in, uh, in Islamic terms uh, that you're trying to achieve a moral outcome uh, in an effective way. So this sort of uh, uh, highlights the difference between their approach to realpolitik and our approach to realpolitik, which is, as I said in the beginning, isn't that they take an amoral approach and we take a moral approach. The difference is that uh, their morals are almost absent anyway. Uh, so uh, it, it comes out looking like an amoral approach because they don't really apply morals anyway, except in terms of uh, packaging. Uh, so the difference between their, as I said earlier, the, the difference between their realpolitik uh, and their other uh, approaches to politics uh, is simply more frank. It's more honest. And that there's, they, they say, well, we will just do whatever needs to be done to achieve the outcome that we want, which is always the same outcome that they want, which is, as I say, power and wealth. Uh, uh, whereas the outcome that we are searching, uh, searching for and striving for and pursuing is a moral outcome. So it's just a matter, again, as I'll, I'll just repeat it again, uh, our approach is simply to take the most effective approach. Uh, that the, the, the proper uh, positioning of ideals and morals is what your outcome is, the outcome that you want to achieve, the outcome that you want to reach, and you want to do it in the most effective way possible because pursuing more, uh, moral outcomes in the most effective way is the most moral thing you can do. Trying to pursue moral outcomes in an ineffective way, uh, I would argue, is in and of itself immoral. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. This leads me to this part in the video where you, you know, gave the example of uh, Abu Dar al-Ghifari radiallahu anhu and you know to understand this balance between piety and pragmatism so what does his uh, you know, like how to say his story what can you know what lessons can we learn from this specific instance for those in position of authority today like how do we understand their role their steps their possible like quote unquote moral compromises because you know what are the dangers of this moral impulsiveness in leadership and how can leaders develop some kind of this because again you spoke about it right like this uh, delayed gratification and i remember uh, ray dalio uh, he spoke about like he, it's the same idea but he spoke about it in like first order consequences and second order consequences where exactly as you said with the gym that you know people it's hard the first order consequences are your body hurts right and the second order consequences you know inshallah you will be fit you will stay and the same with you know brushing your teeth 
right? Like you don't want to get up and do it, but inshallah, you know that you don't want your teeth to decay, right? So always thinking about these, and we as Muslims, inshallah, should be thinking about these second order consequences and this delayed gratification. So I just want to mention like some examples of, you know, this dangerous moral impulsiveness in leadership and how can leaders develop the patience and the strategic thinking that is necessary for the greater good without trying to fall into these short-term reactions because we see it all the time that people really just judge the situation based on these short-term emotional reactions and exactly especially to with respect to the palestinian issue that we have addressed you know a couple of times so like what are the ideal uh, characteristics of a capable leader in islam you know how to develop these traits how what are the dangers of not having these traits so if anybody of our speakers would like to address this point uh, feel free i know it has been mentioned in some parts of our discussion today but if someone is willing to somehow compile it into you know get a uh, full picture like you know what it, what did for example even rasulullah emphasized the qualities in leaders right because yeah of course brother Amr, please so um i think um in order for the leaders to develop those kinds of skills um they have to be like um on the ground and they have to be you know in in times of old whenever um a leader was was chosen to lead the, the muslim ummah uh, uh, usually those leaders who had been on the battlefield or those leaders who had been in contact with the enemy both in times of peace and in times of war were the leaders who got things done most of the time, of course, there were exceptions, but most of the time they were the ones who got uh, things done. So um, it's a matter of uh, accumulated experience. It's a matter of having a good um, like people who are um, uh, a trustworthy circle of advisors who actually have the um, long term uh, benefits of the ummah in mind, who will not shy of saying that we should perhaps um, uh, uh, say um, uh, have treaties or make treaties with the enemy um, uh, and look bad in front of the of the populace uh, in, uh, in favor of having a much more positive outcome uh, in the future. So um, yeah, I think uh, uh, those kinds of leaders and we have you know numerous numerous examples uh, about uh, leaders who have been on the field uh, on the battlefield and on the strategy field. Uh, and contact with the enemy, uh, either in times of diplomacy or in times of war. And those were the ones who knew exactly how to navigate the terrain and how to uh, make, treat, uh, make treat, peace treaties when they were more beneficent or make war or wage war when, when it was more efficient. So um, a matter of accumulated experience and um, on, on uh, being on the ground. Uh, that's it. Thank you so much. If, if there is time, we can add examples, inshallah. Inshallah, uh, we will inshallah look at examples. I think it will be very beneficial, but I would like to ask brother MG if he wants to add something to this. Yeah, so I would say that the most important thing is to identify the needs uh, and set priorities. And the most important thing to understand is that um, we don't live in the in a, in a we don't live in a simplified world. Um, there's lots of layers of battles. There's lots of layers of um, uh, struggles and conflicts that we have. So it's not just with a tank and a knife. It's now you have clandestine wars, you have economic wars, you have uh, social wars uh, through social media and through media. So we we have to identify what is a how to build deterrent and what constitute a deterrence in the 21st century and beyond. And the first thing that we need to look at is uh, the most important thing is the economy. I think building the economy is is of utmost priority, and understanding how how the world really works is important. Understanding that there are OGCFC, OCGFC, uh, there's different factions. Understand how to make your country uh, attract uh, attract the the economic interests so that the stakes are too high for your country to be vulnerable. I think that's the most important thing before anything else. And from there we can uh, work and take the next steps. Thank you. Yeah, mashallah. Uh, brother Nail, do you want to add something? Or Sister Samira, of course, if you want to add some. 
Yeah, I, I just want to add one thing really uh, here. It, it's not so much about um, like leaders, but but obviously it applies to them. Um, we don't have a fantastic view of the world, like as as Muslims. Okay, death is not the end. So you you can't build your society thinking that you will always prevent minimize death. Okay, um, and. Somehow I think that when we talk about this topic, especially um, in relation to, you know, um, winning wars and um, establishing dominion, you cannot think short term. You really cannot do that because, like, you do what is up to you and you do your part and then you meet your Lord uh, after that. And so, so do all the people that live, live in the country. And then you leave, you leave a seed to the next gen generation and, and you provide instructions. You, you create or you try to create a society with, with a certain set of values, right? So it, it is about building. It is about not trying to create a utopia on earth because, you know, that doesn't exist, right? And that can never exist. So but that's one point I think that I'll, um, often Muslims forget because we, um, we live in this globalized society. Everything is fast, you know, flashing before our eyes, and we lose the perspective. You know, that's one thing I'd, I'd like everybody kind of to to remember, and and obviously you know, that applies to leaders as well. Thank you, brother. Um, oh, I, yeah, please, sister. Sorry. Sorry, brother. Just just a small reminder to what was uh, mentioned, I think, earlier about uh, the Prophet Ali Salam, how he understood Abu Dar's uh, sincerity, his, you know, his commitment to Islam and his bravery. Yet, um, but he also, uh, Ali Salam, recognized that he his moral impulsiveness um, may, you know, it it could make it could make him unsuitable, and therefore, especially in uh, certain types of uh, authority. So. I just want to remind to remind the viewers on that, and his response to Abu Dar's uh, request for leadership illustrates that it's you know how important it is uh, to restrain, uh, you know, in the the importance of restraint um, and wisdom and 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 an awareness, political awareness for anyone in a position of authority. So yeah, just just a reminder there. Thank you, sister. Exactly. Like, you know, really people, if you want to understand real politics and Islamic real politics in the best way possible, just, you know, listen to the Sira, read about the Sira. For Muslims and non-Muslims, you will understand where we are coming from, inshallah. And it will, you might see other examples that we have not shared with you or that we might even miss out on. But if you give it the chance and try to approach it objectively, you will see so many unbelievable lessons, inshallah, for everyone. SubhanAllah. Uh, yeah, so, okay, uh, let us move on to some specific examples, right? Because Brother Amar mentioned that, and I think it's really pertinent to this discussion. So let's give it some uh, time. Um, yeah, so Brother Amar, please feel free, whatever examples that come to your mind about this. Because, you know, Brother Shahid in the video, he did mention some examples. So if you either want to expand on that or give something extra, we are all happy, inshallah, to hear it. Thank you so much, Karim. So, yeah, um, so we have many, many historical examples. I mean, uh, we don't have any, uh, we have a very wide pool to choose from. But, um, so, for example, we have this uh, example of um, the, the most famous, is of course, of Salah al uh, who made uh, peace treaties with the Crusaders because he wanted to get the Islamic house in order. But if you come to view the whole timeline, as we are mentioning, then you find that he was the one who set uh, Jerusalem free. So at the time, it's probably it's it's very probable that people were wondering why isn't he focusing all his efforts on the crusaders and the crusader states and so on and so forth but after and this is this is purely known as from hindsight you cannot possibly determine the the the, the full plan during the, the incident itself you have to give it some time which is why uh, we are able to say now that salah din is this great hero is of islam and this great hero of of the arabs who set jerusalem free and he's he's being mentioned a thousand years almost after uh, setting jerusalem free 
So this is, you know, one example. Another example could be uh, uh, the teacher of Salah al-Din, Nuri al Mahmoud, who is not uh, as famous. And um, his example is, I think, a bit more nuanced than Salah al-Din's example. Because this guy, he uh, made a treaty with the, 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 the Eastern Romans, were, which were a huge power uh, at, back in the day. And he said in the treaty that he would be willing to attack some forts for fellow Muslim rulers in exchange for the for the for the Eastern Romans, you know, not uh, not uh, engaging in any politics of the Middle East, i.e., not helping the Crusader states. So um, people would say that Nur al-Din Mahmud is, you know, um, allying himself with the enemy uh, and attacking fellow Muslim forts. While in, in reality, the real situation is he was successfully able to. You, okay, so he would be attacking some Muslim forts, which would be on the grand scheme of things nothing. But he was, um, you know, he was uh, successful at keeping at bay the uh, big superpower of his day from engaging in politics of the Middle East. So that gave him, because he had at the end of the day, and we're talking about a context where he had very, very limited resources, he was able to keep at bay this huge superpower, and he was able to engage with the Crusaders without being, without them being helped uh, by the Eastern Romans. So uh, if you, uh, I, for for me, I when I first read it, I was like, okay, so this guy's, why would he do that? But now, because I saw the video and I'm trying to you know think about uh, uh, past uh, incidents of history with that mindset i can honestly say that nuruddin mahmud actually had a very good tactic at keeping at bay this superpower and it was uh, it helped him pave the way and for the way it had paved the way because Salahuddin did the same thing had them pave the way for the uh, for the saving or the setting free of the so I don't want to take much more time than this. I, uh, there are, as I mentioned, there are many, many examples, but I think those two examples uh, clearly uh, indicate what real politics uh, in an Islamic framework can be uh, can look like. So thank you so much. Thank you very much, brother. Yes, sir. No, I was just going to, I was just going to sort of uh, uh, back up what brother is saying. Uh, there are so many examples that that uh, you know. I, I mentioned the example of obviously Hudaybiya that some of the Muslims responded to <coughs> in an emotional way and, uh, you know, th their hearts rejected it, but it was a strategic move, uh, even though it was a compromise. But there are so many examples, and, and uh, alhamdulillah for the existence of Hudaybiyah, not only for the victory that it gave the Muslims at the time, but because it provided us with this uh, model and this example that Muslims have used ever since, uh, that, that allows us to make strategic uh, compromises, tactical compromises, uh, that are for the benefit of the Ummah, and that's something that Muslims have practiced uh, throughout history. I mean, just like what Brother was talking about, the examples that Brother is talking about, and there are so many, there's more more than we can possibly list. I mean, the the uh, the uh, Ottomans, for example, made alliance with France uh, against the Habsburgs, because they knew that the uh, Habsburgs uh, uh, represented a threat to themselves and also to France. So it was in their strategic interest to align with them. It doesn't mean that we're uh, friends with the Habsburgs. It just means that it's in our strategic interest uh, to have an alliance with them against. Uh, 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 or sorry, it doesn't mean that we like France. It means that we don't like the uh, that that we are trying to take care of ourselves and our own people uh, by aligning with France. It doesn't mean that we are uh, in love with France or that we are uh, uh, puppets of France or what have you. It just means that uh, we we have perceived the threat that's posed to our empire by the Habsburgs. Uh, and we are aligning with them, uh, with with uh, France, because it's also uh, in their interest to do that. The same thing when uh, the the Ottomans had an alliance with Sweden against Russia for the same reason. Uh, there there are so many examples throughout our history uh, that again I think many people are ignorant of this, and I think that many people, uh, you know, there, there's a I, I don't want to call someone out for this, but uh, it's a it's it's worth mentioning because it's a comment that we get a lot. Uh, uh, someone asked me. Now, who's listening to the space? Uh, why, uh, why, why in Saudi Arabia are people not allowed to pray for Gaza? Number one and number two, uh, why hasn't Saudi Arabia cut off the oil uh, as uh, Faisal did in in uh, the 1970s? Now, just the nature of this question shows me that you are swimming in waters that are far too deep for you. Uh, and I want to tell people like this: it's really okay for you to not engage in issues of current affairs. It's really fine. You don't have to. You don't have to get involved in politics uh, uh, if it's over your head and it's simply over your head because uh, everyone knows who's involved in any way and who's informed in any way that they are praying for Gaza 
at every prayer, they're praying for Gaza in Saudi Arabia, in Mecca, in the Haram, every uh, Salat al Jum'ah, uh, the prayers are being offered continuously in every Masajid in Saudi Arabia. So this is, you are taking information from Zionist propagandists, uh, uh, whether, they, whether that is uh, coming through the mouths of Muslims uh, who want to spread Zionist propaganda for whatever reason, uh, uh, but either way, you're not informed uh, and you're just emotionally reacting to information uh, without any scrutiny. This means you're not supposed to be involved in talking about politics because you, you can't even uh, meet this, the, the very basic uh, uh, measure, the very basic level, the very basic standard of understanding information and, and discerning information. And with regards to the question on oil, this is something that I talked about months and months and months ago. Uh, and, and again, the fact that you would ask this question shows that you just found out from someone or you saw some tweet from someone who was talking about cutting off the oil and then it just sounded to you like, oh, that's a very uh, a militant step. They should do that. <clears throat> but the person whose tweet that you read uh, or whose post that you saw on Facebook or wherever else or in, in whatever video short that you saw that you happened to scroll on YouTube or TikTok where someone was talking about that, uh, the person who said that and then the person who's repeating it has no idea what they're talking about. It's not 1973. The United States is a net exporter of oil. If Saudi Arabia were to cut off the oil, they would do nothing but harm themselves and harm China. How does that benefit anyone? Uh, but you think that it sounds like a good strategy. It sounds like a great step. It sounds like a great uh, tactic because you don't understand what you're talking about. And I'm trying to say it's fine for you to not participate in political discourse. You don't have to. But the, 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 there's, a, there's a, a serious problem. I don't want to derail the conversation into a whole other topic, but there's a very serious problem in that uh, political discourse has become a part of the entertainment industry at this point, where people just want to talk about politics as a form of entertainment. And you have uh, uh, pundits who become like celebrities, uh, and people are just uh, imitating their talking points the same way that people sing and memorize the words of songs. Uh, and it has no meaning, it has no uh, validity. And it doesn't matter if it's right or wrong. People just like to repeat it to make themselves sound intelligent. And it's just become uh, a part of the entertainment industry. Uh, and uh, you should take things more seriously than that. And, and, and it's fine if the way to take things seriously is for you to not participate in it because it's over your head or, or because you don't have the time necessary or the energy necessary uh, or the, the gray matter necessary uh, to actually engage in it in a serious way. Uh, you should know this about yourself. Uh, before you try to engage in political discourse and political discussion uh, and trying to understand uh, uh, issues of global politics, international relations, and so forth. It's fine for you to not participate in that. You can just live your life and do the things that you do. Uh, and, and everyone would appreciate it greatly if you would do that, rather than feeling it uh, somehow uh, that you're obliged to participate in these kinds of discussions uh, and these kinds of issues, uh, when by participating in it, you do nothing but uh, hinder understanding you do nothing but create obstacles to understanding and you muddy the waters and it makes it very difficult for actual uh, valuable informed discussion to take place inshallah brother thank you very much for this uh, yeah like, i even ask myself and everyone should ask themselves is this you know something for me <laughs> like there needs to be a big degree of self-reflection when it comes to real politics right you know First of all, try to assess objectively if you do understand all the realities at play and then try to form an opinion about it. Right? Uh, please, Brother MG, feel free to. Yeah, I, I definitely agree with Brother Shahid. I mean, they have expectations of, of these countries that they don't have of themselves. And at the end of the day, the Gulf and, and also Egypt and many other players in the region, they are the gallbladder of the Arab and Muslim world. And they want to work it over time while they drink Pepsi for water. So that's basically the, the analogy that I put it. Now to move on to an example, um, we, I, I always want to be hopeful and say, let's look at an example of today. You have BRICS. And BRICS has many countries that are at odds with each other, with, with very critical and uh, important uh, and important uh, political uh, situations. For example, Egypt and Ethiopia, China and uh, and India, and so forth. So it's not like it's not it's not it, it, like it's not something that we we've seen in the past and it's back into the relics. No, it's something that's happening today. Uh, for example, with uh, regards to uh, to uh, Egypt and Turkey, for example, they were at odds for a very long time, for almost 
seven, eight years, uh, especially with regards to Libya. Now they are working together in rebuilding the Somalian military. So you see that you see these examples today and you just need to make an effort and, and, and look it up and see what they are doing and see the cooperation that's taking place. Be be optimistic. Don't be pessimistic. Of course, bad, there's lots of bad things, but the only way you will remain in, in a bad situation is if you are always pessimistic and not optimistic. Thank you, brother. Uh, yeah, there are so many examples. Exactly. Those that you mentioned now are more, you know, contemporary. What brother Omar mentioned earlier were, you know, historical examples. And really, like, even think about, you know, at the time of the Khilafah of... Uh, Uthman ibn Affan, radiallahu anhu, right? You know, he literally ordered the destruction of the masahif that were not according to the consensus, the standard that was being discussed. Like, imagine what outcry it would have, you know, with today's environment, what that would cause, right? And look what it led to. Alhamdulillah, we have the same exact mushaf for over 1,400 years in every place of the world. You had it in Puerto Rico, in New Zealand, in China, in Korea, in you know, any mosque you go anywhere in the world, you will pray the same prayer, you will recite the same Quran. I mean, subhanAllah, look at the implications, even religious implications that it had. But, I mean, understand what it, what was the reaction at that given point and what are the consequences that we are seeing now, how they were thinking ahead, you know, 200, 500, 1,000 years ahead, right? So, subhanAllah, and so many more examples, of course, but uh, I think we gave at least, you know, some hint at what could have, uh, well, you know, what the idea is of what we are trying to convey. So now I would come, inshallah, to my last question to our speakers, and I hope that everyone will have uh, something to say from their own experience, from their own uh, approach to this. So after all, all this discussion, right, and it's, uh, hopefully, inshallah, people that are here with us will get somehow inspired by what our um, speakers will say. So I would like to ask what does this discussion about real politics imply for the for us, the average Muslims, right? In terms of our understanding, our even supporting the decisions of our leaders, and especially when these decisions do appear so at sometimes to be somewhat morally ambiguous. Like, how can our ummah, or you know, to use Western terms, the Muslim community, how can it cultivate a realistic but some sort of principled approach to global affairs that tries to take into account and acknowledges these harsh realities of the dunya as the as brother Shahid mentioned in the video the dunya is not a nice place all right so while we are trying to maintain these islamic values and lastly just as a part of this question what are the risks that are associated with adopting a purely idealistic stance all right in today's global politics how might this weaken the Ummah in face of these enemies and adversaries who do not share the same constraints that we share? Right. So please, the floor is yours, uh, brother. Okay, ladies first, please, Sister Samira, feel free. Jazakallah, khairan, brother. Um, okay, after all the discussions that have um, that we have been uh, that has been going on, <clears throat> we just have to remember that um, real politic um, is not. Well, in Islamic uh, context, it does not mean we are abandoning it. Uh, we are abandoning any of the principles of the core uh, beliefs. Uh, it, it emphasizes the, you know, the the pragmatic approach um, of prioritizing the long-term goals that we mentioned before. Uh, but we still are aligned with the broader uh, values of the Ummah, and so um, we have to just keep in mind that uh, we, you know. To under, understanding and supporting the leaders' uh, decisions with uh, with realistic expectation and to trust, uh, because we only got them, <laughs> and whatever they are, whatever we think about them, those are our leaders. They have the power, um, uh, uh, you know, to take us uh, to whatever it is our destination, and we know where the, what the des destination is. We were told uh, what our ultimate destination is. So, uh, in the principle of uh, repolitik, if it, if there is anything that teaches us that that every decision can appear ideal or you know fully satisfying from a moral standpoint, uh, but leaders face you know all the unique pressures that we have talked about, the threats. So often they will make difficult choices, just like we mentioned, and therefore we just have nothing 
uh, there is nothing for us to lose if we just uh, uh, trust them uh, and and be very realistic. We we shouldn't. Okay, we you might think they are not doing it for the sake of the ummah of Islam or whatever moral standpoint you have, but they are definitely doing it for whatever it is that interest which is the closest you have to us this interest that they have is the closest to us not the interest of anyone else not the interest of the um, imperialist, imperialist capitalistic west definitely against them whatever the interest of the leaders are is the best the closest to us that is one thing that we have to think about even if we think that whatever they are doing is against our uh, uh, our uh, Islamic value, which I, uh, which of course I don't believe in, but still, even if we do believe that, it's still it's the closest thing. While Islam encourages us to strive for justice, you know, for, to uphold values, uh, mercy, uh, dignity, it also recognizes the need for uh, you know patience. <laughs> patience, um, you know, have to adapt to complex situations. Which is the one example where we mentioned about the Treaty of Hadabia. Imagine yourself in that period and see how you would react, how uh, you would react to um, the enemies uh, telling you uh, how that treaty is definitely not in the interest, that it is something that makes you weak, that your, uh, uh, your leader um, uh, uh, has uh, betrayed you. Uh, it, th those are the terms, I'm sure those were the things that were being said at that time of the Prophet and yet the people stood firm. Yes, there was a backing for them. Uh, there was, um, uh, it was the Prophet and, and these are, uh, in our time, it's the Arab leaders, but again, they are the closest to us uh, in terms of um, the, those in power um, and no one else. And 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 um, you mentioned something about um, the risk of um, pure idealism and how it can weaken us. Uh, it's, it we can weaken us when when we are we expect unrealistic stuff. When when we are expecting them to our leaders to make you know to do magic to just rub the um, the genie and you know uh, just uh, get that discomfort that. Uh, that's something that is bothering us out of the way and help us as if they are, I don't know, a magician. Uh, and now, <laughs> uh, while we are sitting in whatever country, in whatever, as brother uh, MJ was saying, while they are sipping their Coke, uh, their Pepsi somewhere. Um, this, this is idealism. Uh, and th there's, there's also this fact. Okay, I, I need to summarize it, basically, um, we need to educate ourselves. Uh, about the real politic as we are doing right now, or uh, we, as Brother Shahid mentioned, we really don't have to involve in it. We just have to uh, uh, sit back and make our du'as, be patient, and hope for the best because we know uh, the future is bright. And any uh, uh, social media post, whatever that is that we see out there, that is seeking sensational, sens sens sensational reaction. Uh, uh, especially when it comes to our leaders, we just have to avoid it. We have to get as far away from it as possible because it is affecting our moral, our mental health, uh, and our faith. Um, uh, and, and so uh, this is just uh, the things that uh, came up uh, to me on, on this topic. Thank you. Thank you very much, sister. Please, sister Salma, feel free. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Jazakallah khair, uh, Brother Karim. I just wanted to add on to uh, the discussion here about how ordinary people can um, engage or should think about or should consider geopolitics. Say, if you're not privy to all of the intimate details of key decision making uh, in geopolitics, and if you're cognizant of that, you know, you should do one of two things. Either you try to dive deep and try to get an education for yourself, or disengage and go on with your life. Uh, that's the, that's to simply, you know, to put it simply. But if you uh, if you recall in the uh, in the audio recording of uh, Shahid's um, uh, talk on geopolitics, he cites an example of uh, the babies being thrown down the river, because I think this illustrates perfectly, you know, in a in a short visual, you know, their babies being thrown down the river, and most of us are people with the hearts on the sleeves, trying to save the babies. On the face of it, there's nothing wrong with it because you want to save babies, right? But then a man, uh, along comes a man who's walking along uh, the river and he's just walking ahead. 
looking ahead, clearly with a goal and a destination in mind. And meanwhile, the people who are observing him walking past them, trying to save the babies, uh, I mean, you all heard the audio, so I'm just repeating myself here. Uh, he's being questioned, why are you walking away? The, the baby's dying. And he's saying that, no, I'm going to find the source of uh, what, uh, what, what's being done here. And, and that's real politic in a nutshell. You know, if you see problems, there is a cause, there's a root cause to the problem. And if you cannot apply or refuse to apply or do not find yourself inclined to apply yourself to find out why, then it's best that you don't engage for your own sake, because you're just not going to get anywhere constructive. And you're just going to add uh, confusion to yourself. You're going to add misery to yourself, you know. So th this is just a, a small point that I wanted to raise, because the question was, how can the uh, regular people, you know, uh, think about this, consider this. And then on a personal level, uh, there are things, in, you know, within your own little uh, scope, your sphere of influence, ask yourself how you would go about navigating certain situations. And then you will see how decisions are made, how judgments can be uh, ascertained, you know. Again, uh, once again, I just wanted to uh, point out that if this is just beyond your grasp, it's all right to actually disengage. Yeah, I'll just uh, close in real quick. So uh, just like uh, Sister Samira and uh, Sister Sana were saying, uh, we have to educate ourselves and we have to follow the scholars of old. Our scholars actually do know what they were talking about when they wrote their, their uh, treaties on how to deal with the Muslim rulers and how to uh, uh, engage with them and how to um, uh, determine whether or not uh, their actions were actually in the long uh, strategic terms of the Ummah or not. So these guys were not as they as they are claimed today to be um, uh, dissociated from reality or you know um, uh, co uh, colluding with the rulers. Not at all. Uh, our scholars are very 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 important to um, uh, as as a means to understand how we can. Uh, engage with the rulers and with the with the world of today. So I think, yeah, that's uh, all I wanted to add. Thank you so much. Thank you all. Uh, thank you all. Thank you all, mashallah. Uh, some people in the comments maybe still have some distorted views after two hours of listening to real politics. So I would recommend maybe to listen to it again <laughs> with clean ears, inshallah, and uh, understand what is being said and what is being discussed. Because, uh, um, yeah, sorry, I, I, no, 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 I was just going to say, I haven't actually seen the comments, but I can imagine what they might be. Uh, we should, should just point out that a lot of these types of comments aren't from people who have not understood what we've said and what has been discussed, but they're people who do not want other people to understand. So they are uh, offering a counter narrative uh, to try to, um, as I said earlier, muddy the waters so that people can't understand. Uh, people will put ignorant things in the comment section. People will re respond in an ignorant way, uh, not necessarily because they're ignorant, but they want other people to be ignorant. Uh, and they want they know that, for example, on a space like this that's going to be recorded and people can listen to it, people might click on it and go to it, and then they'll look at the comments and see what people have said. Uh, so they're, they're trying to deter people from listening to it. Uh, I, I don't actually give the benefit of the doubt to people, especially if you've been here for two hours and you still are saying ignorant things, then that just means that you are a purveyor of ignorance. Uh, you have some kind of a vested interest in purveying ignorance uh, and perpetuating ignorance uh, and not that uh, you haven't understood uh, because if you're if you're smart enough to even understand how to manipulate a keyboard to put words together then you should be uh, intelligent enough to understand what we've said which means that you're not interested in what we've said and you don't want other people to understand what we've said and you're trying to deter people from getting knowledge uh, that's all that is uh, i don't give the benefit of the doubt to that because you know like i said earlier uh, uh, political discourse has become part of the entertainment industry. So you have people now, uh, politics is like chess. People are playing chess here. Uh, and you have people who are uh, uh, looking over the shoulder of actual chess masters, uh, trying to tell them what they should do, trying to advise them on what moves they should make. Uh, and these are people who don't even know what the rules are of chess. Uh, you have people now who are just, uh, they, they've never learned the rules of chess. They've never played chess. They've never succeeded at chess, but they want to become uh, chess coaches. They just pass by a chess game that's being played in the park uh, and they think it looks interesting and now they want to try to advise people. Uh, but uh, no one has to listen to you uh, and people who actually understand this uh, will uh, immediately know that you don't know what you're talking about 
uh, and uh, it, it's, it's a very strange phenomenon in this current modern age, as I said, uh, where uh, uh, political discourse has become part of the entertainment industry and, and it's, it's something that people do as a form of entertainment uh, rather than uh, as something incredibly serious that affects the lives of millions, if not billions of people in this world. Uh, and we were talking earlier, I just want to sort of close off. Uh, I think it was uh, probably a good point to close off actually with the uh, 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 repetition of the story about the uh, babies in the river. Uh, but I'll just remind one thing again about the fact that nations don't have a lifespan, that leaders have to make decisions uh, that are long-term decisions, and you may want them to do something that will make you happy today. But by doing the thing that will make you happy today, they're actually betraying your grandchildren or your great-grandchildren. They have to think about things uh, in a much uh, lo a larger scale and a longer term than you can even imagine. Uh, uh, leadership uh, is an amana from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, it's a trust from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, and fulfilling that trust includes uh, thinking about the consequences of their decisions for yet unborn generations of people. Uh, it's, it's a level of responsibility that most of us can't even fathom. Uh, so people should try to appreciate that and not take uh, politics and governance and international relations uh, so lightly uh, that it's just something that you can talk about and discuss uh, without having any real knowledge or really uh, any real information or any appreciation of what's really at stake. Uh, if you can be so uh, flippant uh, to make comments, knowing perfectly well that you're talking about a situation that you just found out about this morning, uh, you're not a serious person and you're trying to actually interfere with serious things being done. Uh, uh, this is incredibly irresponsible and it uh, immediately disqualifies you from being listened to. Uh, we were talking about earlier, uh, in the uh, we were having a, a a live stream a live stream on TikTok about the Article Six campaign, uh, and always when that happens, we have to ban some people from the chat because they say ridiculous things. Uh, and then uh, the, the the moderator was getting messages from the person who'd been banned, uh, complaining about that we were uh, uh, not advocates of free speech, that we were violating their free speech. Well, our position is uh, we believe in valuable speech, not free speech. So if you don't have something valuable to say, you will be banned, you will be muted, because uh, we take political discourse actually seriously. If you want to have uh, an unserious discussion, you have plenty of platforms to do it on, and this isn't one of them. And with that, I would like to thank everyone here. MashaAllah, sorry. Uh, I just have to say this was perfect uh, slide, exactly. Perfect closing speech, MashaAllah. I have nothing to add to this because it really surmised everything that was discussed and it's a really serious topic it's not just for anyone to discuss it and just for jokes or you know yeah it's all been said thank you very much everyone who came and listened thank you to all my wonderful and beautiful speakers that are here with me today and sharing these two hours and everyone who listened uh, may allah reward you all may you try to apply what we have discussed, inshallah, in your understanding, in your approach, and how you view realities that are currently ongoing. MashaAllah, thank you, our brother Shahid, for you know opening our eyes. And this is what it's all about. We are just trying to educate ourselves and others, inshallah. Thank you, Sister Salma, for the great uh, approach that you suggested. Uh, Thank you, Sister Samira, and of course, thank you, Brother Nail and Brother Omar and Brother MG. All of you, amazing as always. So, Jazakallah uh, Khairan. And thanks, of course, to all of our listeners, our commentators. <laughs> and inshallah, uh, see you next week where we come up with a new topic to discuss, inshallah. And yeah, may Allah bless you and bless your week and see you then, inshallah. Thank you very much, everyone. Take care. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.